All right, so this evening, we're preaching on safety and security, safety and security. And we read there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, one of the reasons why we started in this chapter, the very first verse says, uh, This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come. Perilous means dangerous. And I fully believe we're in the last days. Uh, there's definitely uh, perilous times even getting more dangerous ahead. I think we're just barely beginning to experience some of the, the perilous times that are coming forward. But we also know um, as we get closer to the day of Christ that things will continue to get worse and worse. Just like it even says here in verse number um, 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We know that, obviously, that those that, that want to do right and live according to the Bible, no matter when you live, you're going to suffer persecution if you try to live godly. But verse 13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's going to be this continual... Um, progression of people just kind of getting worse and worse as we go forward. We know that uh, that Jesus said in Matthew 24 that you know as the days of Sodom with Lot right in Sodom is going to be similar in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, and the same thing as in the days of Noah. It's also going to be similar in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Both of those examples, and they're they're basically side by side in the context for the same purpose. In both of those examples, the people were extremely wicked, and God poured out destruction on the earth. In both of those examples, with Noah and the flood, the people increased their wickedness and ungodliness to where God was just like, he had no choice but to save Noah, just to keep mankind alive, and wipe out everybody else, because people had just gotten so wicked that God just said, this is, this is the only solution that I'm going to be able to, to deal with now is to just destroy these people. They've turned so wicked. And then with Sodom, it's a similar thing. Now, it wasn't the entire world, but the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, and, the, and those surrounding Sodom that were just like Sodom, they had gotten to the point to where they were reprobate cities, and God just had to rain down fire and brimstone because the people had gotten just so wicked and vile that that was the only solution, just to rain down hellfire and brimstone upon them. And as those days were, it's going to be like that in the last days, right before Christ comes back. I mean, if you think about it, that makes perfect sense. You see the, the history of people getting really wicked, then God steps in and judges. People get really wicked, God steps in and judges. Well, there isn't going to be a greater judgment than what happens when God pours out his wrath after the rapture of believers. So when God really just pours out, I mean, that's the, you know, people talk about biblical times. They're referring to Revelation. They're referring to all of these events that are going to take place. And it's funny if you hear people on the news or someone talks about biblical times. That's not, that's not happened yet. We're not in that yet. The biblical times now would be like the beginnings of sorrows. But we haven't even gotten to the point of the persecution of the saints, let alone the wrath of God. But all of that being said, you know, it, we're, we're headed towards dangerous times, especially as believers. So it's important to have a good sense of safety and security as we head into dangerous times and knowing that we can you don't even have to be upset or, or have a bad attitude about the times that we're going to face ahead because we have all the safety and security that we need and, and it's not something we need to fret about. It's something we need to be informed about, something we need to know about, it's something that God doesn't want us to be caught off balance and not know what's coming and that, that we'd be, you know, take us by surprise which is why we have so many warnings about the, the end times events, and so many warnings about these things to come, so that we could be ready, we could be awake, we could be watching, we could be ready, so that that day doesn't overtake us as a thief. So that we're there, we're ready, we're watching, and we know what's going to happen. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So as the sin increases, sin goes up, love goes down. 
Because when sin goes up, that's just people being more self-centered, people just thinking about their own lusts and doing what they want to do and everything else at the expense of other people. It's always what happens with sin. Sin always costs, and it costs against other people. And then the love goes down, so it becomes more dangerous. So as sin increases, thefts are going to increase, murders are going to increase, you know, all of those, all the bad things that make a place dangerous will increase. And love gets cold. Uh, and that was from Matthew 24, where, uh, I was, as I was already mentioning, we know that this, you know, in the last days, that's going to be the case. So uh, more of a reason to, to know that we do have safety and security. Jesus, now physically speaking, Jesus even advised when he left this earth the first time for his disciples to have a sword. And this is found in Luke chapter 22. You can turn there if you'd like. Uh, we're going to end up going to Leviticus 26 in just a minute. Luke 22 verse 36, though, basically Jesus had just gotten done asking his disciples, hey, when I sent you out, because when he was on this earth and he was sending out his disciples, he sent them out two and two to go and preach the gospel and do the work for the Lord and everything. And he said, you know what? Don't carry a script. Don't carry an extra coat. Don't carry, you know, all this stuff. Basically, just go out and all of your needs will be supplied everything. You don't have to worry about having as extra gear. You don't have to worry about where you're going to stay. You don't have to worry about having extra money. You will be cared for. Obviously, one, teaching a point that, hey, we can completely rely on God and he will supply everything that we need to do the work that he has for us to do. But that was also while he was on this earth and while he was providing that protection essentially for them to go out and do this. But now when he's getting ready to depart, he's saying, you know what, I'm getting ready to leave. So now when you go out, it's not going to be exactly the same as when you went out before. He says, now when you go out, uh, verse number 36 says, then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. Right? So, so now take your money with you. Before you didn't have to worry about it. Now I want you to, to bring your money with you. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So he's instructing here. Look, if you don't have a sword, make sure you got one. Make sure you're now going to be well defended and well, you know, well protected. Look, ultimately God is still going to be the defender. And that's the, the, one of the greatest truths that we have when it comes to safety and security. Proverbs 21, 31 says, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. And this is exactly what Jesus is instructing them. He's instructing them as the horse is prepared for the day of battle. Right? When, what, what this proverb means, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. You still get ready for the battle, for the fight. You make sure your horse is ready, your horse is geared up, your horse is ready to go. You've got your armor, you've got your weapons, you're ready to go and fight. But at the end of the day, safety is still of the Lord. Because all of those physical things, if God is against you, aren't going to do you anything. But it's still up to us. We still ought to be preparing and doing and acting to our best ability while we rely on the Lord. And that's what's being taught here. Just as Jesus was saying, hey, you know what? Make sure you got a sword. Make sure you got your money. When you go out, preach, still do all the same work. Just be prepared. Just be ready. God will still provide safety and protection for you. But he's saying, you know what? It's a dangerous world out there. Make sure you, you're, you're well prepared. And he's leaving, so he's not going to be able to, like, watch over them. Obviously, we know Jesus is God, but in this physical sense, he's preparing them for his departure, for him to be gone, and them to continue to operate while he's no longer on this earth, no longer present. Turn if you go to Leviticus 26, if you didn't already. Now, when it comes to safety and security, the, the world's answer to this, and too many people do this, Christians alike, they'll look to the government for their safety. They want to feel safe. They want to feel protected by government. And this is actually, even the children of Israel felt this way when it came to uh, when they wanted to have a king. So you remember they had the period of all the judges, and then Samuel was getting old, and his sons were, were these reprobates. And uh, no one wanted to have his sons ruling over them. And they were, you know, they, they didn't know the Lord like he did. And, and they're just like, well, we don't want these guys to be our judges. We just want to have a king. 
we want to have a king over us, so give us a king. And there, at that point, you know, God instructs Samuel, he tells them, hey, look, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me from ruling over them. And the problem with that is that the reason why they wanted a king is that they see the other nations of the world and they see the king going out into battle and fighting the fights for the people and he was this big hero, right, as, as being in charge, which is funny because these days our, our so-called kings or our political leaders, they're the farthest away from any battle or any conflict that's going to happen. They're not going to be the ones on the ground. It used to be that that's how people even got popularities because they were good um, fighters and good warriors and able to lead people and lead in battle and be successful that way. Now it's like the exact opposite. They want to send everyone else's people to do to get killed and, and not have any part of it themselves. But I digress. The fact of the matter is, though, if you're looking to the government, you're looking to the leader, you're looking to the president, you're looking to a king to provide you with the safety and security, you're not going to get it. Because what you need to be doing, and what the children of Israel should have been doing, is looking to, to God as their king, and looking to God as their defender, looking to God as their protector, looking to God to be the one to lead their battles for them. They don't need the human instrument here to, to go forth and put their trust in a man. They ought to have been putting their trust in God to be that king to go forward and fight their battles. But when you look to the government for safety, in, in today's day, what are you going to end up with? More police more laws on the books because and th that's how people just think like well what are we going to do to stop this i know let's make another law it's like if they're not following these other laws what's another law going to do it's like you look at the gun control stuff and it's like it's already illegal for certain people have guns you know these criminals it's illegal to go and shoot people but they do it anyways we want to make a law now so that they can't so the person that wants to shoot and kill people can't get a gun well, they're not supposed to murder someone either, but they do that. So what is the law going to do against the lawless, against the people who don't care about nothing? So looking to that for your extra protection, that's not going to do anything. All it's going to do is just provide more laws and more rules against on everyone else, which is ultimately just going to bring less freedom and more bondage and more power by the ruling class. That's at the end of the day, what happens, and you get more of a police state, more lockdowns, more less liberty, and more everybody's presumed guilty instead of everyone being presumed innocent type of an attitude and type of mindset as things get worse, as things progress. And look, I mean, let's face it, we've got a lot of things going on in a day where there was a lot more riots and unrest and, and people steal. Now, nowadays, people can go in and steal and shoplift in many parts of the country and no one will do anything about it at all. Police don't do anything about it. People just walk in, steal, and leave. And it's like, if it's not over a certain amount, no one will ever end up doing anything about it anyways. Because iniquity's abounded so much already. And I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy out there. I mean, we can look at everything that's happened even just since 9-11 all in the name of safety and security that's happened to this country. I mean, now it's like you want to travel, you practically got to get undressed, take off your shoes, take off your belt, do all this stuff to get on an airplane. It's insane. I mean, look, and people who are younger, it's just going to be normal for them. Oh, yeah, go through the body scanner, go through all this other stuff. But it's all an illusion of security anyways. People who really want to do bad things, they can bypass those measures. I'll tell you that right now. It's a fraud to think that that's really keeping you safe. What it is is, is a whole other level of control of the whole public. Now they even have, I've, I just noticed this the last time I flew in, um, in Atlanta airport. They're not in all the airports yet, but they're, they're taking a picture of your face when you travel. Why do you need a picture of my face? How is that keeping me safe? Well, it's nothing to do with your safety. They'll, they might tell you it's for your safety. Oh, yeah, we just want to make sure that, you know, our facial recognition software doesn't pick you up as a terrorist. It's the mark of the beast system that's being put into place. And I don't want to get all off into that, but 
the technology is there to be able to do that to prevent people from traveling, prevent people from getting on planes, prevent, you know, right now it's, oh yeah, there's these really bad evil people, but then what happens when you become the evil people? And see, people are willing up to give up that control and just say, oh yeah, protect us from this, protect us from, protect us from these really scary people, government. Okay, well, we'll start taking pictures of everybody. We'll take your biometric data and we'll just keep a database of everyone and we'll keep a log on you and we'll keep tabs on you and we'll keep you safe. I mean, if, if anything should tell you how well the government can keep people safe, go to a prison. Talk to people in prison. Ask them how safe it is in prison. I mean, those people are on lockdown 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's funny because there's still stabbings in prison. There's still a bunch of drug use in prison. There's still a bunch of people getting beat up and, I mean, raped, whatever. All, all manner, all manner of wicked, evil, sinful things happen inside of a prison. And that's how well the government can, when given total control, are able to protect. No, safety is not going to come through politics. It's not going to come through Donald Trump or Joe Biden or any other puppet politician you want to throw out there. It's not going to happen under any of those people. You know where it's going to come from? It's going to come from the Lord. Amen. If you're in Leviticus chapter 26, we're going to see this. These great promises of God and the blessings of God and the safety and security of God that he provides when people obey him, when people listen to him, when his laws are in place, when we can look to the law of God as our lamp, as our righteousness, God likes that and you know what? God will protect you when you follow what he said. Look at verse number three, Leviticus 26. The Bible says, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season and the land shall yield or increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. So first he's just talking about the blessings of like your your of your food supply. Being well blessed because it's gonna be well watered, everything's gonna produce. And now that when it talks about the vintage and the sowing time, the vintage is the is the leftovers, basically everything that you've harvested and now your your stock, your store. All that food will last you all the way through the next time you're sowing and you still have to wait for the crops to grow again. He's like, I'm going to bless you so much that you'll just have plenty of food to go all the way around year after year. You won't go hungry. You'll be able to dwell in safety. I will bless you if you keep my commandments. Let's keep reading. Verse number six. And I will give peace in the land and you shall lie down and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. He's saying, you know what, you, you put your trust in me, you, you start obeying my commandments. I will keep peace in your land. Even the wild beasts, even wild animals, he's saying, I'll make sure they don't come in and destroy you and devour you and, and attack your families and things like that. I'll drive them away. God is promising that protection. Verse 7, and ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. So even in physical conflicts, even when someone does want to come and try to attack you or, or aggress against you, he's saying, God is saying, I will chase your enemies away. I'll make sure that they fall before you. Now, obviously, they shall fall before you by the sword, meaning people ought to have a sword, <laughs> right? They ought to have something to defend themselves with. God's saying, I will... Drive them away. You have your sword. Be ready to go. But God will instill the fear in them. God will make it that you, that you win and they lose. God will step in in the battle. Verse number eight. And five of you shall chase an hundred. And an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. This level of safety and protection that God's given you is, I mean, these are astronomical odds unbelievable, unworldly, because they literally come from God. In order for a hundred people to put 10,000 to flight, I mean, if you had 10,000 people against a hundred, you know, what are going to be the Vegas odds on the hundred winning, right? If you were to put that up on, on a books and say, what are the odds of 100 be people 
beating 10,000 in a fight, in a battle, in a war. Well, God's saying, hey, I can do that. You put up 100, you, you, can, you can repel 10,000 and make them flee and run away. That's some great safety. For I will have respect unto you, verse 9, and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. And ye shall eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. And I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God and ye shall be my people. What great safety knowing, hey, we are the people of God. We're following God. We're obeying his commandments. We're doing what's right. And God says, you know what? I'll dwell among you. I'll just be right among you. Verse 13, I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondmen. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenants, I will also do this unto you. And we'll get into that in just a second, but what he's saying here is that if you don't listen to me, if you're not going to follow me, if you're not going to follow my commandments, and you despise my statutes, and, and you know Christians ought to listen up, if you, if you despise God's statutes and his judgments and what he says is right, here's what he's saying he's going to do. I will even appoint over you terror. Terror, being terrified. Being extremely scared. Consumption, being consumed. And the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. He's saying, you're going to go be brought back into bondage. You sow the seed, you sow the plants. You're not going to reap of that. You're not going to get a benefit. It's going to go to other people. You're going to have to send it away. You're going to be taxed. You're going to be sending your goods off to other people to enjoy the fruits of your labor. That's what happens when you are disobedient to the Lord. Verse 17, and I will set my face against you and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. Now that's a state of fear to be in. No one's even chasing you and you're still running away because of the terror, because of the fear. And if you will not hearken, if you, excuse me, verse 18, and if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass and your strength shall be spent in vain for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate." And if ye will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And the curses go on and on and on, basically, and God's saying, if you still won't listen, if you still won't listen, if you still won't listen, it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And for, you know, this is for the nation. This is for the people. We can apply this individually. We ought to, when God's correcting us, when we're dealing with chastening from the Lord, look, you get right with God because God's not going to relent. God's not going to back up and back off, if you need to be punished, if you need to be disciplined and you have a stiff neck, God's going to keep going until you see things his way. And I'll tell you what, here's a piece of advice for parents too. Take that to heart when you're raising your children. When you get children that become stubborn and they think that if they just keep doing whatever they're doing bad, whatever they're being naughty about, whatever they're breaking the rules with, 
and they could just keep doing that, you have to have a stronger will than your children. Because if you give in to their demands and what they're doing that's bad, they're going to learn that now it's okay. Now I know what to do to get my way. Now I know that if I just persist long enough that mom and dad will get tired of it and they won't want to deal with it and then I'll just get my way. And that is sending the wrong message. You have to be a rock. You have to be a stone going, no, this is the way things are going to be in this household and that is that. Amen. And if you keep breaking the rules, you will keep suffering the consequences. And if you keep breaking the rules, as God does, he says, okay, now it's going to get worse. And now it's going to get worse until you understand this is the right way. And this is the way God deals with people. This is the right way to get people to come around. I mean, people are acting wickedly and doing wicked things and not wanting to obey the commandments of the Lord, and not trusting God. This is what he does to his people. Okay, well, here we go. We'll start with this, and then it's going to move on to this, and then it's going to move on to this, and then it's going to move on to this, until you finally just wake up and go, you're right, God. I'll change my ways. I'll get right with you. But the, the huge contrast, the difference between the blessing and the curse, right? The blessing of the safety, security, no fear, no hunger, no disease, just, just nice, peaceful living. The peace that goes along with following God versus the drama, the terror, the fear, the, the pain of having to deal with the consequences of not following God. All the sorrow and the misery that goes along with that. Let, I mean, let that sink in. When you're deciding how you're going to be living your life. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 23. It's important we have that understanding from Leviticus that, we look, we need to be upright. We need to be doing what's right. We need to be following God's commandments to, to be secure in our safety that comes from the Lord. But I also just want to stress how safe we can feel and know that we are when God is with us and, and what God even promises for us and what we see in scripture of just the total level of support that we get from the Lord so that we can have that total sense of security that you can be completely safe. I vaguely, vaguely, vaguely remember, I have very little ch memories of my childhood in general of like, like earlier than I don't even know how old my earliest memories are of like actually remembering things. But a lot of other people can remember things way earlier than I can. I don't know why I can't, but I do remember the feeling of being a young child and like being held by my mother or being held by my father and having that total sense of carefree, knowing you're secure, knowing you're safe, knowing you're loved, being in their arms was just a, a total relief, easy to fall asleep, easy, you know, everything is fine. And we as believers can have that same exact level of security and comfort and knowing that no matter what situation we're in, we can feel that same way with God being our provider, our protector, our father to, to keep us safe. Look at Psalm 23, famous Psalm, verse number one. The Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Look at verse four. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Scary place to be in the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. <coughs> thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord 
forever. It's a great, comforting, uplifting psalm, but knowing that you could be walking through the valley of the shadow of death and still have no fear, no reason to fear whatsoever. The, the, actually, the prompting for this sermon came from listening to the song, Safe Wherever I Go, and it just kind of, it's a great truth in that song that you can have safety and security and just knowing it doesn't matter where you go or where you are or where you find yourself. You can have comfort and solace and peace knowing that you are ultimately very safe wherever you are. And especially when you're, when you're serving the Lord, you have nothing to worry about. Amen. Nothing. And just have that extra feeling of peace and security and safety is amazing. See, fear is what paralyzes Fear prevents people from doing things. It silences people. It stops people. Fear will prevent you from doing the job that God has for you. But of course, we're commanded by Christ, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Turn, if you would, real quick to 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, when we try to follow this command of the Lord by going out and preach the gospel to every creature, that's going to bring you to all corners of the world. And when we preach the gospel, we try to target the poor first. Because that's also a biblical thing to do is, hey, let's seek out the poor. Let's seek out the fatherless and the widows and the poor people of the earth, the meek of the earth. Let's, let's find those people and go and preach the gospel to them first. Now, we're going to preach to everybody, but we're going to find them first. And when you target that area, you may find yourself in areas that are also the most dangerous neighborhoods to be in in an area. Physically speaking, right? I mean, there's going to be the most shootings and robberies and other things going on in these poor communities and poor areas where we want to reach people with the gospel. But when we're doing the Lord's work, what we have to understand is, you know, trust that God will protect you and take care of you and provide for you. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about. I've had people in my extended family and people say, you know, when, when they find out what we're doing and that, well, you brought, you know, Leslie and the girls. And at the time, you know, we had maybe just uh, the two oldest as little babies and stuff. And yeah, we have a stroller and we're walking down the street in some of the poorest and worst neighborhoods. But you know what we're doing? We're preaching the gospel. And to this day, Guess how many violent things have happened to us while we've been preaching the gospel? Zero. Yeah. Amen. Now, I also just want to point this out. It's not to say that you'll never have something evil happen to you while you serve the Lord. Right? Right? Because, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We just read that. Right. We know that things will happen. We read in Acts chapter 7 about the martyr Stephen. I mean, he was preaching the word of God. He was doing everything right. He's preaching what he's supposed to be preaching against people that needed to hear it. <coughs> and he ended up getting stoned to death. Okay, so evil came upon him. But that... that Death, that martyrdom, was of the Lord. God allowed that to happen. It's not because God wasn't with him. It was his way, and, and in that death, glorifying God and being able to serve him to the utmost with his life. So, my point is this. You can feel safe and know that you'd be safe because even if something were to happen physically, while you're doing the work of God, you know God's with you. So if anything happens physically, it's going to be for the cause of Christ. And at the end of the day, here's the, here's the last and ultimately most important reason why you can feel safe and secure. It's because even if you did lose your life, where are you going? To live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. 
We have no fear or uncertainty of where we will end up once we breathe our last breath. There's no doubt about that. There's nothing scary about that. In fact, it's going to be a joyful thing when you go to be with the Lord. Like that's going to be a great day for every single one of us that's saved when we breathe our last breath. We know we're going to be with the Lord. So what are you going to do? You're going to send me to the mansion that's prepared for me early if someone were to do something evil or wicked against you. But the thing is, <coughs> that's, only, that's only going to happen when God is going to allow that to happen. If you're following the Lord all of your days and, and doing what he has for you to do, he will keep you safe through every situation until it is your time that he has planned for you to, to join him in heaven. And he's not going to allow for random acts of violence or things like that to take over you because he's there to protect you. He sends his angels to, to stand guard. You're in 2 Kings chapter 6. Look at verse number 15. This is the story of Elisha when there was an entire army set against him. Verse 15, <coughs> the Bible says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Now notice, they came around the city. These horses and chariots of fire were around Elisha. God can protect even the individual with all of these horses and chariots and angelic beings to watch over and protect and make sure that everything is going to go well with the man of God, with the servant of God who's going forth and doing the Lord's will. Elisha didn't, I don't believe he saw them physically with his own eyes. He just asked that his servant's eyes would be opened up. Why? Because he already knew. He knew God had his back. He knew that God would protect him. He knew there's things that he can't even see that he trusted in fully and had the confidence. His servant was afraid. He had fear when all these armies show up. Elisha had that comfort and that confidence knowing that he was safe regardless of all this entire army. I mean, imagine the United States Army like coming against you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever, any country's army for that matter. I don't care how small they are. Any army coming against you and it's just you. What the Bible's teaching us, you have no reason to fear. Zero reason to fear. None. As stressful as a situation might be and seem, we have no reason to fear. You can have total peace and rest in your heart in the most dangerous situations because you know that God is with you. The Apostle Paul said this in 2 Timothy 3 where we started. He said in verse 11, Persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yeah, he faced you know, difficult times and persecutions and all these other things happening. But he said, you know what? God delivered me out of all of them. He's kept me in fear, trying to, to get him thrown in jail. All these evil, wicked people working against him. Everywhere he went, there was people trying to start uprisings and get people against him. <coughs> but he's, he always said, hey, God delivered me out of all those things. Everything that he was doing, God was able to protect him. God delivered him through it all. So as I close the sermon, we're going to sing that, la that last song. Safe wherever I go, I want you to, to take it to heart and understand that as you serve Christ, as you serve God, you have no reason to fear what man can do unto you. As we get into more difficult times, as the cancel culture grows, as there's more hatred towards Christianity, no matter what happens in this world, 
don't ever fear. Don't be afraid. God sends the terror on his people that, that are disobeying him, that are not, that don't care about his commandments, that, that are not uh, looking to the Lord ultimately. But we are looking to the Lord. We are looking to the commandments. We are looking and striving, and we want to hear everything that the Lord has for us. And we're trying to implement these things and trying to live by these things and trying to do the things that God has for us to do. So you know what? We can reap the blessings of God being there for you and, and knowing that God can provide and protect and keep you safe regardless of how many people, no matter how scary they are, no matter how much power and influence they have, can be nothing compared to God and what you're do you serve God, don't worry about anyone standing in your way. Amen. Nobody. As far as I've word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your promises and for being there for us and ultimately being our, our ultimate defender, dear Lord, and um, giving us the security that we know that we have a home in heaven that is secured, that, that you've sealed us with your Holy Spirit of promise, dear Lord, and that uh, uh, we are yours all the way up until the day of redemption where you're going to take us home. God, thank you for providing that security for us and for also allowing us to not have to be fearful in any situation in this world, dear Lord, that, that we know that, that you can see us through everything and um, through any persecutions, through any trials and tribulations, um, that you will find the, the right path for us and, and help us out of them all, dear Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.